Welcome back to Everything Marketplaces, where we talk with founders and leaders from some of today's top marketplaces. So this is episode 60, and I'm really excited to welcome on Jacqueline Bumgarten, who's the CEO of Boatsetter. So if you're not familiar, Boatsetter is a leading online marketplace for boat rentals that operates in over 600 markets and has raised over 31 million in venture capital. So Jacqueline, welcome to the uh, group chat. It's definitely uh, great to have you join us here today. So I'm super interested to uh, learn more about Boats are as a marketplace and your journey scaling it. But uh, before we jump into things, maybe you can start off by sharing a little bit more on your background for those that don't know you, and then the uh, founding story of uh, starting Boats are. Yeah, I'd be happy to. First, thanks so much for having me. I'm delighted to be amongst other fellow marketplace uh, experts. So my background, I, I took a bit of a circuitous path to entrepreneurship. I come from three generations of entrepreneurs. So the bar was pretty darn high for me. And I thought if I'm going to start something or join a family business, I wanted to make sure that I came to the table with unique skills and a solid foundation of training. And so I was a bit of the black sheep in the family in that I didn't just jump right into starting something out of school and uh, was a late uh, launch in turn into entrepreneurship. So after college, I did strategic management consulting because I thought, okay, what a great continuance of my education to see how companies solve challenges and how they grow and how they think strategically. So I did that for, I don't know, probably close to six years and then uh, felt that itch of, I really want to build something and I want to grow something. And, and with consulting, you make recommendations, but you don't really get to stick around to be part of the solution in these companies. So I used that as an opportunity to go to business school um, to transition careers. And I went to Stanford, got my MBA, and I took wanting to build something really literally. So I went to work for the largest um, commercial real estate developer for shopping centers, got to wear the construction hat, the boots, you name it. And uh, I ran the largest development in the city of L.A., and I call that sort of my first entrepreneurial experience because what it taught me was how to lead teams of people who were exceptionally more skilled and seasoned in their field of expertise than I was and learn how to get everybody focused around a shared vision and to do it on a timeline and on budget or under budget if possible. And so it was an incredible experience of taking um, the last remaining 34 anchors in the city of LA and doing the pre-construction entitlements, pre-development on that project, which at the time was going to be a 2 million, no, 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 4 million square foot mixed use project, the biggest one in the city. And it was an exciting journey until the economic crisis hit in 0809 and we had to pause the development and so we had started pre-construction. They took the entitlement work, put that on the shelf. And then I transitioned into my second entrepreneurial adventure, which was they paired me with a gentleman who ran all of the marketing and operations of the malls and said, Jackie, find a way to make more money out of our existing centers. And so it was great because I literally got to start from writing a business plan, doing the modeling, and getting buy-in and we built a subsidiary called Westfield Media Group where all the signage that you see at the malls when you're driving by that you see we even built our own massive two-story LED digital rotating signs and after the first two years it generated 60 million in incremental revenue so at that point I had the confidence I had the experience I had the training and I had the skills that I felt it's time it's time for me to start my own thing I was middle management, not making that much money. All the money I made, I had put into the down payment on my condo in LA. And so <laughs> I thought, if there's ever a time, this is it. And so back to your second question, how did Boat Setter get founded? Initially, I knew I wanted to create something, but the truth is I didn't quite know what I wanted to create. I just knew I wanted to build. So I did something that was extremely terrifying to me and totally out of character, I quit. And I gave myself the greatest gift and what I call the gift of time to really think through what I wanted to build. And so during that process, I thought if I'm gonna build something, I want it to be something I'm truly passionate about. And so I started to think about what my happiest memories were growing up. 
And when I think about joyous occasions and memories, what do I think about? And you know, you mentioned that you grew up around Lake Lanier, and I think, and I hope you can relate to this, but for me, my happiest memories through childhood was being out on the water with my dad and my three brothers. You know, we'd go out every summer. My dad was originally, um, my, both of my parents were from Chicago. And so every summer they would go back and we would go out on the lakes and I learned to water ski, we'd watch the fireworks. And I thought, how amazing would it be to be able to make this experience accessible to anybody? And prior to creating this company, getting access to boats and owning boats um, was quite restrictive. You know, I was a woman, number one, meaning I was an outsider from the boating industry, if you look at the stats, and I couldn't afford my own boat. And I thought if I could create a marketplace, making this experience accessible to anyone and really breaking down the barriers that would stop people from getting access, number one, the price, the cost, Number two, being able to keep, afford, and maintain a boat. Number three, not knowing how to get behind a, you know, I didn't feel comfortable commanding a vessel. I couldn't get behind the wheel and, and take a boat out. And so I went out to break down those barriers one by one. And I knew that boat owners, private boat owners in the U.S., I, my brothers are two of them, um, have a real challenge of an underutilized vessel costing a lot of money. So in the United States, there are about 12 million registered recreational boats. And it floored me when I discovered this, but they get used an average of 12 to 14 days a year. That's it. So I thought if I could find a way to help owners offset the cost of ownership and make getting access to a boat easy and seamless and add in captains so that you don't have to have any prior boating experience, the magic could happen. And um, before I knew a marketplace like ours could exist, there was one fundamental problem that had to be solved. So owning a recreational boat, you know this having owned one, your recreational insurance policy on that vessel excludes coverage the minute you collect a dollar in exchange for that vessel. So it truly was impossible prior to us for a private boat owner to rent out their boat. And a commercial insurance policy wouldn't make any economic sense for somebody who wanted to do this occasionally because those are underwritten for companies that do a minimum of 63 rentals per boat. So I went out and set out to solve that fundamental problem. And that was creating the very first peer-to-peer -peer marine insurance policy. So I learned everything I could about the top claims reasons for boats. And I went out and I pitched to underwriters as though they were gonna be investors in the company. I talked about how I would set up the operations of the business to mitigate the risks of those top claims reasons. Things like doing the handoff of the vessel at the fuel dock instead of from your slit because that's where most damage happens to the boat. Um, adding the captain element to really restrict damage. And after about a year, eight months actually, I finally convinced a maritime underwriter out of the UK to build the first peer-to-peer -peer insurance policy with us. And um, we did. We developed the very first marine peer-to-peer -peer policy, which means that when you list your boat on Boat Setter, we don't touch your recreational policy. It stays in effect. But when it rents out, our primary policy now, which is with Geico and Boat US exclusively, becomes primary and exclusive during the rental to protect the boat, the boat owner, a captain if there's a captain aboard, and the renter. And then the minute you're stop renting, it's back on their primary policy. So that's how Boat Setter began, and we founded the company. And I founded the company. That's awesome. That's some uh, really incredible, uh, you know, background and experience that you have. And uh, thanks for sharing the uh, story with us. It's really cool. Um, so it's really interesting that you started with one of the uh, biggest uh, challenges at first, which was, uh, you know, the insurance kind of component to it, uh, which is big for a lot of the marketplaces here. Um, so it might be helpful. I, I believe that was with Cruisin. Is that is that right? That's right. So the company was originally called Cruisin. And we got the policy, but I couldn't get exclusivity on it because he wanted a million dollars. And at the time, I think I mentioned to you, all of my money was in my condo, which I put on the market and put everything I owned in storage. And that was my seed capital. So as a result, two other companies got access to that policy. Since then, um, I've merged with Boatsetter. We kept the name and acquired the other competitor. And we've now worked and established uh, the leading and only peer-to-peer -peer policy with Geico 
and Boat US, which we have exclusive access to. That's, that's uh, yeah, that's that's really interesting. So could you maybe uh, uh, share a little bit more about kind of that decision early on um, to join Boat Setter? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So at the time, you know, when you're starting a company, fundraising is, you know, one of your full time gigs as a founder. And you always have a plan for use of capital, what you're going to do with that funding. And it was actually an investor that approached me and said they were surveying the market. There was Cruisin, Boat Setter, and Boat Bound at the time. And they had seen that I had solved the insurance product and program. And uh, Boat Setter, which was uh, located here and being run by my co-founder, Andy Sterner, was um, about, had a better MVP and had invested in some of the technology. And so we were about to start collecting money and investing in the same things each other had. So the investor suggested that we consider merging and that they would invest $2.5 million. And at that time, when you're hand to mouth and you know, you, you're not unable to raise capital and you're just starting with a dream, $2.5 million sounds like a ton of money. So I got on a plane, flew out, met Andy, we hit it off. We were a great match and we decided to move forward. Uh, with the merger. He became chairman at the time, and then I ran the company going forward. But the irony is during that process, we got to see the true colors of this VC, and they weren't pretty, to say the least. And we have an NAR rule. You can translate what that is. And we decided to move forward without their investment and consummated the merger. You know, so if we go back to kind of the early days um, with that merger and then, you know, the kind of uh, the earliest days with building Boat Setter, what were some of the initial challenges, you know, maybe convincing uh, boat owners to join um, and then, you know, maybe, uh, you know, trying to, uh, um, you know, solve a, a potential kind of challenge with uh, generating demand? Absolutely. So with a gig economy, you always have the challenge of maintaining that equilibrium between supply and demand, right? It's, it's the ever present challenge. And for us, we decided to focus on a core market um, to prove that we could execute this in South Florida first before raising capital to expand into new markets. So initially it was supply, particularly given that we were creating an entirely new category. Boat owners had no idea that this was legally and insured and in even um, available to them. So it was a lot of education. It was walking the docks with dry ice in a cooler and ice cream sandwiches myself for an entire summer, talking to any owner I could and talking to them about the program to get the first boats on. Uh, then naturally it flips to demand and you can drive demand a variety of ways, acquiring it through you know, digital performance and paid channels. Uh, but for me early on, because capital was tight, I leaned heavily towards strategic partnerships as a way to secure supply. So partnering with major marine owner operators, partnering with the National Marine Manufacturers Association and Discover Boating, and finding creative sort of hacks to be able to get access to the marketing, both direct and indirect channels that I needed without having the cash to be able to buy it. So, is, so you did mention for the, the marinas, for instance. So could you maybe share more about maybe uh, how you thought about exploring that partnership and how that actually kind of uh, came to be? Mm -hmm. So the first partnership in the marinas that I targeted was with a company called West Trek. And uh, the CEO of that company is a gentleman who really loves his privacy, is not a public figure, and made it incredibly difficult to get a hold of him. I could have probably set up a meeting with the president of the United States more easily than getting that deal. I literally had <clears throat> two different marina owner operators, <clears throat> one that had bought a marina from him, another one that had sold his marina to him, ask him to meet with me. Nothing, silence. <clears throat> so this is where being an entrepreneur and being a little bit creative really helps knock down barriers. I thought, okay, this guy is focusing on rehabbing building marinas. So development is a core part of their business. I know development. Now I just come from building malls. So one of my first early investors ran, um, was a partner at one of the leading uh, investment banks providing funding for developers. And I, I contacted him. I said, I need you to do some research. I need you to find out who funded their last development project. Lo and behold, it was his business partner in his firm. I said, 
I said, you have to get me a meeting with the CFO and the CEO tomorrow. And, and those were the right strings to pull because they needed access to their capital. I got on a plane within 24 hours. I went down and I met with <clears throat> the president and it was supposed to be a 30 minute meeting turned into three and a half hours. He loved the concept and he was a little bit skeptical and said, look, I just don't believe that boat owners will ever be willing to let a stranger on the boat. But if you can convince me otherwise, and you can prove to me that you can get this done in, and I'll give you access to my prized marina in, in Ho Hollywood, I'm sorry, in Hollywood Beach here, Hallover Marina, then I'll open up my portfolio. That was a Saturday when he called me after our Friday meeting. By Monday, I had a lease signed on an apartment here in Hollywood, and I was setting up shop in his marina. And within the first three weeks, we were able to sign up 10% of his uh, tenants, which was mind blowing. And at that point he said, you have access to my full portfolio and I'll be an advisor. So that's how it, it kicked off. So you did kind of mention earlier uh, as far as the captains for the boat. So I guess uh, <clears throat> maybe break down kind of boats that are as a marketplace for us. Cause it sounds like you have, you know, the boat owners, the captains and then the, the, uh, the renters. That's true. So in essence, we are a three-party marketplace. We have the renters, we have the boat owners, and with the boat owners, that falls into two segments. We have peer-to-peer, -peer, which are privately owned vessels, where we have exclusive access to those boats, and we also have commercially operated vessels by professional operators. And the third component is the largest database of U.S. Coast Guard licensed captains that we've built over time. We uh, acquired an asset called captainswanted.com and we go out and we work with captain schools and we recruit captains on a, on a regular basis. So the way it works, let's say you go look for a boat in Miami. <clears throat> an owner when listing a boat decides, I'm comfortable letting my boat out to a qualified renter who has experience and doesn't necessarily need a captain or I'm only gonna rent my boat with a licensed captain, click. At that point, what we do is we open up our network of captains within a certain radius of that vessel and we'll match multiple captains to a boat. Those captains have their own reviews, their own profile pages, the own experiences that they can provide. So when a renter comes to the site and they're deciding they want a boat, they can say, hmm, I want a captain or I don't want a captain and they can select the captain accordingly. Sounds uh, quite challenging to, uh, to manage the kind of liquidity with, uh, with three sides. It, it is, but it naturally, you know, comes into place, especially given, you know, depending on the contract and that whether it's a time charter or bare boat charter, sometimes the captain and crew are included uh, for the vessel. Got it. Got it. Yeah. So I, it might be also helpful to um, share a little bit more about what the typical kind of uh, the rental is like. Is, is, that, is that like a day or is that like charters or? Well, let me, let me start because I realize I haven't given a quick overview as to what boat setter is. So that might help. Um, so what we are, we are the leading destination digital platform for on-demand experiences on the water. So whether you wanna go fishing, whether you wanna go sandbar hopping, whether you wanna do water sports and water skiing or wake surfing, whether you want a full holiday in the Caribbean or in the Mediterranean on a yacht, um, we can make any experience happen. So our boats range from 19 foot runabouts all the way to now 300 foot super and mega yachts. This year we launched Boat Setter Fishing as its own vertical and we launched Boat Setter Lux, which comes with more of a concierge white glove support service. So whether you want a beautiful, you know, 60 to 100 foot yacht for the day or you want it for multiple days, we can accommodate that and provide you with the float plan, all the goodies and add-ons you'd want from drones to provisioning to jet skis. So pretty much any experience on the water you wanna create, Boat Setter can make that happen. So, so as a marketplace, how did you think about kind of expanding categories? So, you know, expanding from, you know, the peer to peer to more of the kind of luck side with charters and, you know, the different experiences. So it's interesting. Initially, I knew that the real competitive advantage and lockout that we had created was peer-to-peer -peer because of our exclusive insurance policy. The challenge was in order to have a healthy marketplace, you need to have enough supply. And I was creating a category and that was going to take time to educate and convince owners to put their boats on. So initially we thought, okay, immediately we have to go out and get professional operators that are used to consummating transactions and dealing with customers. 
we wouldn't necessarily have exclusivity and locking in that customer. We had risk of disintermediation, but we'd have to get to a certain, what I call equilibrium or, or um, you know, a, a level of inventory to make sure that if you come to the site, you've got five choices of a similar type boat at a similar price point in your geography to choose from. So initially we started onboarding the commercial operators and then educated and working to bring on peer to peer. First couple of years, our revenues and our transactions were heavily weighted towards professional operators. Now I'm super proud to say that the fastest growing segment is peer to peer. And over the last year it exceeded and flipped about you know, 70, 30. And it depends on the market. In some markets, it's almost all peer to peer because we can organically grow a location that isn't a traditionally penetrated market with commercial operators. So the real value is in peer-to-peer long-term, um, but that's, that's how we began and shifted. Yes, so uh, how many markets are, are you currently in? Well over 600 markets across the globe. We are a global marketplace, so um, inland lakes, coast to coast, all across the U.S., key destinations throughout Mexico, the Caribbean, the Mediterranean. We've even done transactions off of the coast of South Africa. So anywhere you wanna go, we can make it happen. One of the things that I'm super interested in uh, learning more about and uh, you know, all of us as marketplace founders here is the kind of a playbook that you use to expand or uh, you know, launch a new market. So um, is there one that you kind of use to, to launch in these markets? So every market is distinct and you're gonna learn that when you're doing localized marketplaces. And I'm sure each of you on the phone who have done this yourself can attest to that. <clears throat> and the data is at the core of driving decisions. And that was a big turning point for us where we went from using gut instinct and just being scrappy to finally getting really sophisticated about being able to launch and grow a market in a cost-effective way. So. I would say that the major shift happened when I started to bring in the right team members. Um, you know, I brought on a new president in uh, February of 2020, um, someone whom you know, Rachel West, who is a phenomenal data-driven expert. And she helped us really build out our data and analytics team and really refine the product so we could track effectively. And we doubled down last year during COVID, especially when the market was locked down. It was a very scary time. We didn't know if we were gonna, you know, our revenues were gonna be 20% of what they year, were a year prior. And we actually went and had a healthy discussion and debate with the board saying, we're not gonna cut back and let people go going into the pandemic, even though we can't tell you what's gonna happen you know, over the next nine months. But we know that this is an opportunity and a critical time to invest in what we know will drive scale in the company. So we built out, tripled our data analytics team. We tripled our product team. We invested in our tech team and we launched new product um, in June of 2020. And that allowed us to be able to measure at the sub DMA level, what we call our, our districts or markets and see what that liquidity ratio was in a market. And we could tell if it dropped or if it was off we could dig in and say, for example, in Chicago last summer, we need five more boats, 27 to 32 feet in length, because that's where the conversion rate is dropping. And then I could laser focus the resources that we have. You know, we're spending a lot on human capital on our supply team to just focus on the boats that we need in those markets. And it drove cost-effective outsized growth from, you know, 200 to 600% growth in those markets year over year. So when we came into budgeting this year, Rachel and I told the board, we're gonna double the business in 21. And by applying this principle, I can tell you that we have every month more than doubled. We've exceeded that target. And so I think that is a critical step function in our growth and our ability to scale going forward. So on that note too, you know, what is the uh, team size like today and the kind of uh, the org structure? So we're about 70 strong in peak season, um, and we have an army of interns that we bring on for supply, customer support. So after the season, um, we'll probably right size back to between 50 and 60. Got it. And uh, well, yeah, what are the kind of, out of curiosity, what are the kind of seasons that you see? Like oh, generally boating, speaking? Boating is a highly seasonal market. You know, over 50% of 
our revenues are generated in one quarter, 70% in two. So Q2, Q3, it's game time for us. So Q4 is about reinvesting in the product and getting everything ready for the next season. Q1, we do have active markets year round like Florida, Mexico. Uh, so we'll shift all of our focus marketing for supply and demand to accommodate that, but um, we are a heavily seasonal marketplace. That, 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 that's really interesting. That might uh, prompt some questions here in the, uh, in the group, group Q&A here in a second. Um, mm -hmm. So before we jump into that though, um, I would love to learn a little bit more about what your journey has been like fundraising too. <laughs> It's always a good question. <laughs> is it a journey or is it a nightmare? Is it? <laughs> no. we, we, can, we can take it either direction. No. So um, it's interesting. I think my journey may be different than others. I was a first time female CEO. And I think that brings with it certain challenges and a path that is perhaps unique to others. As a result of my own experience, as I mentioned, Early on, um, you know, I could use my Stanford network and get meetings and people would open doors on Sand Hill and I had my first meetings, but then I got the very polite, thank you for your time, come back later. And so it was very difficult for me initially to raise funding. So as I mentioned, my initial funding was the sale of my condo, close friends and family, um, high net worth within my network and getting scrappy about striking critical strategic partnerships that would in turn provide me with the resources that I would have used that what would have been more dilutive capital for. Um, and that was the first couple of years. Then I was able to graduate, you know, and, and raise more high net worth family offices and then eventually venture. Um, and we've had major strategic investors like Airbnb, like Geico, things of that nature has also helped. So the journey I think is a challenging one but I've learned and developed some critical skills and playbooks for fundraising, depending on the life cycle of the company. So I've got a, a toolkit that I use if I'm going after high net worth individuals and, you know, my own customized CRM, my own probability uh, counter, and I've sort of turned it into a science. And then the other thing is, you know, as you start to get more sophisticated and, and, and more importantly, talking to more sophisticated investors, uh, such as venture capital or even growth, which is who we're talking to now, the focus and the KPIs and the metrics that they're interested in varies. And it, it shifts from being about telling a story to knowing your business and letting the metrics tell the story. And I think that's where, as a, as a woman, it was more helpful for me because I know my business inside and out and the metrics are strong. And going into a meeting, knowing your business inside and out, being able to address any question that's thrown at you is critical. Whereas I think early on, um, one of the differences I've noticed in terms of, you know, I've advised female entrepreneurs, I've advised male entrepreneurs, and I think we take a very different approach to early stage seed funding. And men tend to be better storytellers, as much as I hate to say it. I think it's a reality. And as a result, I think they had, do have a leg up for the early seed capital in, in, in that storytelling exercise. Once you move to kicking the tires and looking at the numbers, it's fair game. And I guess it might be helpful uh, to, to mention, um, you know, the, the timeline. When, when you initially uh, kind of launched, uh, I believe it was in 2012, right? So, you know, early on in the sharing economy and kind of, you know, what it was like kind of raising from friends and family kind of early on in the days. Um, mm -hmm. Could you maybe share more about kind of, you know, given at that, at that point in time, what it's like kind of building a marketplace in a sharing economy? <laughs> hard. <laughs> if I were to put it in one word, it was hard. So early on, um, we didn't launch until about 2013. 2012 is when the company was formed. That first year was about getting the insurance in place and the MVP. So it was the end of 2013 that we, we commercially launched. And I'm a big believer that as a founder, you have no right to ask anyone for money unless you have skin in the game, which is why I put my condo on the market. I used that as my seed capital and I went the first two years without taking a salary. So yes, it's challenging. Yes, there's sacrifices. And I think that level of commitment is what gives the investors who know you or who you build relationships with that sense of confidence and trust in, in, in trusting you with their capital and that you are going to shepherd and utilize that capital in the most cost-effective way for the shareholders. 
Um, it's, it's been probably thousands of meetings that I've had. Um, I had to get very used to hearing no. Um, I now know what it's like to ask the prettiest girl at the dance uh, to dance and be rejected. And uh, you just can't be faced by it. And I think a skill that I wish I had early on and that I wish I had someone who had gone through my experience coach me early on was have the confidence in your conviction. You are building something that no one else has the courage or the skills to do it. And investing in your company is a privilege. And move away from the sense of like desperation, I need the money, I need this investor. It's the opposite. And had I approached it with that mindset early on, I think I would have raised a lot faster. And I think, you know, one of the skills I've developed over time now that I'm keenly, keenly aware of is my BS meter. Um, I can read body language. I can tell when somebody's being polite or just kicking the tires and has no intention to fund. I'm not going to waste my time. It's my most valuable and precious asset. And so now I, I coach early founders to be fiercely, fiercely protective of their time. That's great. I think uh, we definitely needed to hear that. So, and the, uh, the thousand meetings. So, <laughs> yes. Cool. So we're going to jump into questions here, if that sounds good to you. Um, hey, jo Joseph, do you want to jump on? Yeah, sure. Thank you so much. Hi, Jacqueline. Um, thank you for sharing all your, your great stories. I love what you shared about uh, captainswanted.com. Um, so my marketplace, Dimeless, we connect uh, vetted AI data science teams uh, in Canada and North America with projects. So we have no shortage of supply uh, in terms of the talent, but now we're trying to figure out how to acquire projects on the demand side at scale. So mm -hmm. what do you recommend in terms of something similar to uh, captainswanted.com? Now it goes to your regular website, but what do you recommend in terms of the demand side, setting up something like that where we can uh, source these projects at scale for our teams? So I can only speak to my experience and what's worked for us. Um, and what was critical for us was getting the data and analytics in place to be able to truly measure the efforts that were being put in rather than guessing. So first invest in your data and analytics and data science team, make sure the tracking is in place and then be willing to test, iterate quickly, measure and adjust. So for us, we've tested a whole variety of, of paid channels. We've tested partnership paid channels. We've tested, um, you know, we've tested social as channels um, and direct strategic partnerships doing email campaigns with partners that, you know, yields, when you have a targeted audience, I find that yields a much higher conversion. So I, I feel a little out of place um, advising you because I don't know your business well enough, but I can tell you for us, it was all about understanding where our target customers are and testing, measuring and iterating on the different channels. And, and you can play with attribution models. Right now, there's a lot of debate internally that we have, is it last click, first click, you know, how many, you know, how you alternate that attribution model can provide very large swings in terms of your measurement of success on a channel. So keep that in mind and make sure you have really good and thoughtful data partners to work with. Um, so that would be my guidance for demand gen. A question on captiveswanted.com. Uh, what did that look like in terms of um, you using that as a lead gen? More than anything, I'll tell you, it was the strategic partnerships that we redirected to that channel. So going out to the captain schools where young people were already getting their license and about to graduate, didn't have jobs. I found that younger people were more willing to be service oriented and more familiar and comfortable with the tech. So that's where we had the greatest result in going to the schools, partnering with them and basically lining up a career for their graduates, which was a win-win for the schools. And then just sending them directly to captainswanted.com to start the registration process. All it was, was a, was a funnel. Thanks so much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Awesome. That's a, that's a good question. Um, hey, uh, Tomas, you want to jump on? Yeah, sure thing. Um, thanks, Mike. Um, and also, oh, yeah, there. Jacqueline, really appreciate it. Ah, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep, the quarantine locks. Love it. <laughs> um, yeah, and also I really love being able to hear from your story. Um, similarly, had started with uh, strategy consulting for a few years um, and then have since uh, joined the, the entrepreneurial journey um, on a like a water-related marketplace. So 
definitely appreciated you know hearing some insights from from your your perspective um high level overview is i'm building a company marketplace called simple surf and what we do is uh effectively um create a convenient way to share unused resources to get people in the water um, specifically around board sports uh to get started um and what would be really helpful to to hear about is um kind of a little bit more about um, how you were thinking about aggregating both supply and demand at the very beginning, kind of like the zero to one, um, uh, and then and then the one to two. Um, like, what did what did that look like, um, and what were some uh, like surprising insights, you know, if any? So, okay, from zero to one, um, the first step for us, and at least for me, was I had to make sure that supply was first and foremost. Uh, before I even thought about turning on the spigot for demand, because you're going to spend a fortune or you're going to expend energy to bring people to the site. And if they don't have a quality experience and selection, you've wasted your money. So focus first on the supply. And in terms of the major learnings, um, I did a lot of focus groups with boat owners to understand what their fears, what their concerns were, what their hesitation would be from listing. And even worked with major boat manufacturers, Brunswick, to do survey of boat owners. I worked with Boat US to survey their boat, mem yeah, boat US members. So collected data in you know the thousands to be able to really understand what were the barriers that would prevent people from listing on the platform, and then designed and made sure that we implemented into our operating model the components that would address those concerns. And then in our communications, we craft our communications proactively uh, assuming we knew what their hesitation or their fears would be and making sure that in the messaging it was being addressed up front and foremost. So I think doing that background um, research is critical and crafting your message accordingly is key. Super helpful. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, that was definitely really helpful. So thank you. Um, hey, uh, Stefan, do you want to jump on? Yeah, sure. Um, hey, Jacqueline, nice to meet you. Um, also had a, the idea kind of, um, our, our, our marketplace is called a friend with a, and so it's all those times that you wish you had the friend with the boat, car, or whatever it is. So um, we've, uh, we've actually kind of found a little niche in like electric sports. Uh, so kind of like high-end tech toys, um, things like electric bikes, one wheels, electric skateboards. Um, and so we're getting a little bit of traction now and we're kind of uh, getting close to maybe where it's we've been bootstrapped for so long and now it's like okay maybe it's time to start our first race uh, that I guess after being bootstrapped for so long and being so scrappy now it's like okay what would I actually do if I did raise that money there's so many things that I could possibly invest it with and so I was wondering for you it sounded like you had to be really scrappy for a while um, went, went a few years what did you decide to do with that first institutional money that you raised? So prior to going out to raise, you're on the right path. It's super important that you can articulate exactly what those use, what the use of capital will be. So deciding on that even before you raise, I think is step one. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I can't speak to your marketplace. Every marketplace is, is unique. But I had to show and prove before I could go out to institutional investors that I could develop an equilibrium and a healthy marketplace with healthy unit economics in one location first. I couldn't go out and raise until I proved my model in South Florida. And once I had healthy metrics, I could show repeat rental rates, I could do cohort analysis. Um, you know, I could show them what my cost of acquisition per customer was versus what we assume the lifetime value of that customer would be. I needed that fundamental data and proof point to be able to go out and convince and bring on board smart institutional funding. Yes. So that I think whatever you have to do now to get those data proof points in place and stay focused. I heard you say like, I don't know where to spend that money and, and, and sort of the hair on the back of my neck stood up because I relate to that. As founders, we tend to be really creative and have a million ideas that we want to pursue. And, and for me personally, this has been one of my most difficult learning 
challenges in, in running the company and why I think it was so wise to bring in a partner who is now the president, who is truly like a laser focused operator, who's very methodical in her approach. Because if it were up to me, there's a thousand things I'd want us to build new revenue streams and, and, and the key to success, like, you know, a, a great idea is a dime a dozen. It really all comes down to execution. And that's a very difficult lesson for founders to learn um, because we are by our nature creators and creative thinkers. So getting somebody to help counterbalance you and keep you laser focused on what we call the critical few, I think is essentially um, important and helpful for that raise as well. So that's super helpful. Um, yeah, I think uh, we just started kind of doing a little bit more data analysis, um, kind of doing some conversion tracking and that's been super helpful to find like the weak parts in our funnels and everything. Mm -hmm. um, but I was just curious, like what did you guys actually like decide to invest in? What was the first thing that you guys at Osa, um invested in? Was it a new location? Um, and no. just kind of going all in on say the um, market or something like that or no first and foremost the majority of our investment has been into our tech team okay and then after we had tech tracking and the core foundation of the product in place then it shifts to marketing i think if i were to simplify it into those buckets that's how i would describe it awesome thank you very much you're welcome that's a great question. Um, hey, uh, so Jacqueline, I had a question. So what uh, what kind of keeps you up at night as a CEO? I can tell you what used to keep me up at night. Well, no, 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 it's the same thing. Um, when I first started the company, um, a friend of mine who was also launching her company and she's brilliant, this MIT valedictorian grad and you know MIT PhD in computer science, just brilliant. I was renting a room in her house and the two of us were launching our companies from her living room. And so one day she wrote on a post-it note and said, your job as CEO is to make sure you never run out of money and stuck it on my computer. And I swear to you, I looked at that. I touched it every day until it disintegrated. It, um, and it, it's true. It's one of the most challenging things you have to do because you can have all of these great ideas and visions, but they take resources. And without that funding, you cannot invest and build what you want to build. And I personally felt an incredibly heavy sense of obligation and duty that for everyone I brought into this company, I made a commitment to them and to their families that you know I was going to work day and night to ensure that there was a future for all of us. Um, and so that burden weighed very heavily on me. So fundraising has and continues to always keep me up at night. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for uh, thanks for sharing that with us. So it looks like uh, we are we're good on the uh, questions here. Um, so before we kind of wrap things up, though, you know, I would love to learn a little bit more about uh, what's ahead, you know, what's exciting for a boat setter here coming up. So I like to think about the fact that we created a category, right? We launched and built the first peer to peer. But I'm focused on creating not just a category king, but a category queen. You know, we are we are a female led tech company, so we are going to own that uh, caption. And I want to move into new verticals by leveraging the ecosystem of the owners, the captains and the renters. So we, over the next few years, will be rolling out new revenue streams and new verticals. Some of the things we're looking into eventually is possibly boat sales, boat financing, boat leasing, um, and you know, also continuing to understand and look at the insurance component of our marketplace. There's a lot of opportunities for us to continue to drive new revenue streams and uh, build out what we call our category queen. I, I love it. Yeah, that definitely sounds like uh, you know quite the exciting uh, future. Um, so you did mention it earlier uh, before we started recording here about uh, an office and a Ibiza. So I have to learn more about that. <laughs> so we had our headquarters in uh, Fort Lauderdale pre-COVID. Uh, let that facility go and everyone's been working well remotely but we do have our first satellite office because we wanted our four way foray into europe and we have a team in ibiza spain 
and a fantastic office that's half bar and then half booking um, facility on one of the marinas itself. So that is a fun, beautiful location. If any of you happen to make your way to Ibiza, I encourage you to stop into our offices there and have a drink and enjoy the view. We also have an office uh, in Seattle where the team is probably growing the fastest. We've been able to recruit some phenomenal talent out of Seattle onto the team. That's awesome. Yeah, we might have uh, some here in the group take you up on that uh, on that offer. So. <laughs> Well, cool. So last but not uh, last thing, right before we uh, wrap things up, though, um, I would love to learn just, uh, you know, I, I like to ask uh, what's like one kind of a memorable kind of moment or funny story in your journey, um, you know, building your marketplace. I'd love to uh, hear one of those from you. Ooh, OK, that's a tough one. Let me think. Or, or mm -hmm. may, may, maybe that it'd be better. Uh, a better question for you would be, um, you know, what's one of your uh, favorite kind of experiences, you know, using boat set or yourself? OK. So um, somebody mentioned water sports, right? Um, I'm on the board of Mastercraft. So I have a special affinity for that particular brand and they have world-class products uh, for wake surfing. And uh, it, you know that, that boat was on Boat Setter and getting to learn how to wake surf and taking families out and seeing them have that experience and light up with joy is so much fun. So much so that we have some family friends who would go out and learn to stand up and hold their little girls on the board while they were surfing. You know, those moments where you see, you know, families, multi-generations enjoying boat setter and getting to see their eyes just light up and knowing that that's something that's gonna, that, that, that they will fall back on as a memory throughout their life to me is why I do what I do. Um, and I'll, I'll tie it back on a personal note. My father passed away six months ago. And as I mentioned to you, one of the main reasons I started this company was because of the memories I had with him on the water. So getting to see that we are actually achieving that mission of getting more people out on the water and exposed to this amazing lifestyle to me brings me all the joy. And I, I I said we talk about data, so I can't, I can't end this without throwing some stats out there. Um, we set out with a clear mission, right? Our mission was to make boating accessible to anybody, anywhere. And I am so proud to share that on Boat Setter, we have completely expanded the demographics and access to boating. Over 75% of our renters are under the age of 45. Our fastest, uh, our over 50% are millennials and 43% of our renters are women, which is just unheard of in the boating industry. So that's what I'm super happy about. Yeah, as, as you should be, that's, uh, that's definitely really incredible. Um, and that uh, really, you know, kind of uh, hits home as far as, you know, actually making uh, boating more accessible and uh, enabling the experiences. So. Mm -hmm. Well, this, yeah, well, this was a really great chat. I uh, really enjoyed it. And it was uh, awesome to learn more about boat setters. So thanks uh, for taking the time to join us here and uh, share more. So uh, last but not least, uh, where can we, uh, time for a quick plug, where can we keep up with you? Fantastic. So you can always check out boat setter at boatsetter.com. And uh, I tend to post on LinkedIn and um, it's Jack Baumgart on, uh, on Twitter, if you want to meet me there. Awesome. I'll include that in, in the, uh, in the description of this. So, well, cool. Well, thanks. Thank you so much again for uh, joining us. It sounds like you have someone at the door. So that's a perfect you time to wrap that. it up. <laughs> <laughs> perfect timing. Right? Thank you guys so much. Those were fantastic questions and I wish you all, all the luck in the world on building out your marketplaces. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks everyone for the uh, questions. Mm -hmm.